All right, I'm going to talk for a while. And I think I'll cover what I would have covered in a pre class video. So um, I think I won't make a pre class video for today. Um, Tim, did you have a reaction to the reading? But um, I was going to get to it, but at the moment I was at the hospital. So I was, um, I have, I'll get into it after this though. Okay. I just wasn't able to get to it. Do you have the book? Um, I should. You don't know if you have the book? I'm pretty sure I do though. I have to check. All right. Because this is like the fourth chapter or third or fourth chapter. Yeah, the fourth chapter. So, okay. Um, let me start out. I'll talk for a while and then you react. Um, okay, so uh, Meg Green failed in 1979, said no part of the world is more hopelessly and systematically and stubbornly misunderstood by us than the complex of religion, culture, and geography known as Islam. And I will point out that Islam, the majority of Muslims do not live in the Mideast. They live in this, the um, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, over in uh, Southeast Asia, actually. So, we have hopelessly linked Islam to the Mideast. And the problem there is the Mideast has oil. And so we get really messed up our conflicts due to oil and money and power and our conflicts due to Islam. So when you go to Indonesia, they have an entirely different culture and geography and the religion is different there. Um, so that's important. And I will talk about Indonesia on Wednesday. Um, yes, here's another issue. I think I've talked about this before, but here's here it is. There's the religions of the book, and then there's the um, mystical religions, Hinduism and Buddhism. And there's Confucianism, which is sort of a nature-based religion. So there's a lot of other philosophical, religious traditions, worldviews. So the religions of the book lend themselves to doctrine because there's a book. And if you don't believe in the book, I can kill you, you know? So that's kind of why I think you can get away with stuff. Why there's so much animosity. I mean, if you want to find a way to justify killing Jews or Christians or Muslims, you can just pick a quote in one of your books and that's it. You'll find it. It's just that it is not the spirit of the religion. It's not what any of the religious leaders wanted. It goes against the way of life. But you can quote something. So then you all have to have to think about, is your faith based on a quote and a set of beliefs, or is it actually a way of life? And the religions of the book are going, I mean, I'm sure you know many people who quote, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the light. No one comes to the Father except by me. Okay, let's go kill the Muslims, you know? Or the Quran says, um, uh, kill the infidels, right? That's a surya, but it didn't mean every single non-Muslim. It was within a context of a particular battle. But you can pick the quote and you can use it for your own purposes. It's just that after you take this class, you can't believe that you're, you can't believe that that's the right thing to do because there's no way that's the right thing to do. There might be people who do believe that, although it's pretty hard to combine that with the Sermon on the Mount. Forgive, you know, love your enemies. Anyway, so they actually are cousins, technically. The Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims are all related. 
Now, the, the uh, doctrine is that somehow the sons of Abraham are special. And so because I'm Jewish or I'm Christian, I'm converted or I'm Muslim, I'm special. And I'm living out a special plan that this personal God has for me and my people. And then I can ignore all these other people. This is a literal view of this is anti-humanistic. So this is where the anti-humanistic branches of these religions, they all have them. And this is why. So you have to think about it. Do you emphasize the humanistic side or do you emphasize the doctrinal side? Incidentally, Europe was plagued by religious wars because even among Christians, they would kill each other based on whether you had to baptize your baby or whether you thought Jesus literally turned the bread and wine to his body and blood or whether as Luther said, he did it once and we don't, the priests don't do it. Or Wesley says it's all symbolic anyway. I mean, you go to war over stuff like this. So even within the same religion. So take heed, okay? <laughs> um, now, what about Muhammad? He was, he considered himself, he was considered the seal of the prophets. There won't be any more. Why? Here's the main point. Muhammad said, it's the same God, it's the same doctrine. But when the Jews were faltering, the theory, the Christian theory is that God made himself into a person and that's Jesus the Messiah in order to save the world. Okay, so somehow Christianity is better than Judaism or whatever. Then, um, Muhammad claims that Jesus died too soon. And so people didn't really learn how to incorporate that way of life, the Sermon on the Mount, into a permanent way of life. Jesus didn't get married. He didn't have kids. He didn't have a job. He didn't exercise economic power. He didn't exercise political power. So God ordained, Jesus was killed before he really was a model for a complete way of life, which embeds the same doctrine, same God. So then God sent Gabriel to speak to Muhammad and, and set up a program, which two of you pointed out, right? The five pillars, and Muhammad also is an example because he was a husband, he was a father, he was a, an economic leader, he was a political leader. So he sets a, a much more complete model for what this way of life would be. And then the claim is there won't be any more prophets, like Muhammad was the seal. That was the last task that God had. All right. Whether you accept that or not, I don't care. But the thing that's interesting to me is that every time Christians misbehave, right? When the world finds out, you know, they're violent, they're um, wicked, they're greedy, they're whatever. Whenever we portray a very negative image of who we are, that is a way that Muslims recruit Muslims, more people into Islam, because obviously someone who's interested in recruiting more people into Islam is going to say, look, the way the Christians act, that just proves what Muhammad said, or what God told Muhammad, that Jesus died too soon. And so Jesus has not been able to give those American Christians an adequate model. So that's why Islam is a better religion. It's not a different religion, but it's better because it organizes. It shows how you're supposed to live this life. So every time we act in a self-indulgent way or irrational, 
you know, somewhere somebody's getting some traction off of this and more converting Muslims because of it. So I would, you know, I would advise you if you want to stay Christian to make sure you behave yourself. <laughs> unless you want the world to get taken over by islam or unless you want more muslims in the world and that's up to you but anyway that's how we appear to the rest of the world i guess myself um, anything that gravitates away from a humanistic point of view that is an interfaith point of view and a point of view that can incorporate secular humanists and religious humanists I mean, obviously, I'm a philosopher, and so I would favor whatever brand of humanism, as long as the humanist part is taken seriously, and you really focus on flourishing, on living a virtuous life. So that's my position, but each of you has your own position, and you write your own paper. So now, the next thing is comparing Jesus comparing Socrates, Jesus, um, Confucius, Buddha, and Muhammad, right? All right, Muhammad was an orphan. Who else was an orphan? Confucius was an orphan. Jesus was a mere stonecutter's son. Socrates was, I mean, Jesus was a carpenter's son. Socrates was a stonecutter. Um, and Buddha, was a prince, but he gave all that up. So the idea is that these people don't have status, they don't have money, they don't have power. None of those things is important, but they made it to uh, the pinnacle of living a good life. So just because you're born into privilege does not mean you're morally better than anybody else, and you're more likely to be corrupted by your privilege. So heads up, <laughs> guys, right? The wisdom literature is often co-opted by the privileged class, like the Brahmins, like the Athenians, thought they were the true, you know, patriotic Democrats, which they were not, like the Sadducees and Pharisees and all these privileged people claimed to be more holy, but they're not. And all the stories are telling readers, no, that's not true. If you have a religious leader that's telling you that, he's corrupt. Okay, so what was his like his life like? So so he grew up with all this corruption. Well, who else grew up with corruption? Uh, Socrates saw Athens go downhill. Plato saw Athens go downhill. Um, Jesus saw the Jewish leaders uh, corrupt and the people becoming more corrupt. Um, Confucius grew up in the middle of the that huge war between all the tribes and the complete collapse of civilization. And Buddha grew up watching the corruption of the Brahmins and the untouchables and all that um, suffering uh, around him that was legitimized by the Brahmins. Uh, you just have to have another reincarnation. You know, it was some mistake you made in the past. So, uh, Mohammed, again, you should remember uh, college students. Lots of people around college age decide they grew up in the midst of corruption and they want to do something about it, right? Some kind of corruptions. There's many, many, many kinds. <laughs> But anyway, so he grew up with all this chaos around him and a lot of different religious traditions. And those people used um, fatalism, mysticism, um, Satanism. You know, they were really dark religions. They inspired fear and people would pay them money to tell their fortune, to try and relieve them from their fears and it was corrupt. Um, so they needed a deliverer. And Muhammad was disgusted with it, like he was a good little boy, you know. And um, he started a caravan business and 
when he was 25, one, one, the person who employed him was Khadija, who was 15 years older. And they got married and um, they had children. And also she was his first disciple. She was the first person that recognized that he really was hearing the word of God via Gabriel. Okay, so what did Muhammad do? He retreated from all this corruption. And um, among all these religions, Allah was one of the deities and Allah was described as a creator provider. There were Hanifs, uh, a group of contemplatives who worshiped Allah. So they were the only monotheists and Muhammad became a Hanif. And he went up on this mountaintop and they would have these all night vigils to try and conjure up the presence of Allah. And um, then Muhammad experienced this night of power. So if you remember, Buddha had this conversion experience, his enlightenment experience, Jesus had his baptism experience. Um, and Confucius had his great going forth. All of them had this certain, uh, you know, point of change, conversion. And the angel Gabriel said, proclaim, you should proclaim what I'm telling you. He went back to Khadija and she was his first convert and he preached for 23 years. He was persecuted, insulted, and outraged. Who else was persecuted? Well, Socrates was killed. Confucius was almost killed. He was starved out. Um, Jesus was killed. And uh, Buddha was not. He just started a new religion. But anyway, this whole idea of religious persecution based on orthodoxy, based on people resenting someone for being too virtuous and calling out, calling them out over and over again. Okay, again, ministry. He didn't pander to miracle hungry idolaters. Okay, who else didn't pander? Remember when the Bible told Jesus, why don't you turn these stones into bread and then everybody will follow you. And Jesus didn't want people to follow him based on I'll do you a miracle if you follow me. Like that's doing a business deal like you throw. I'll scratch your back if you scratch my back, you know. So he didn't pander to miracle hungry. Buddha did not. If you remember, that was the, the Brahmins were pandering to that stuff, mysticism and miracles. Um, and um, Confucius didn't claim to be any kind of supernatural guy. And Socrates didn't, he said, I have this voice that talks to me, but it didn't, he didn't, it just tells me what not to do. It wasn't anything, he did not want to be worshiped at all. He didn't even have a doctrine. He just asked people what they think and it exposed their corruption. So Socrates is not into miracles. Jesus, if that wasn't what he emphasized in his ministry, there are people who emphasize that part, but I don't, that isn't Jesus' main message. The Sermon on the Mount is the message. This is how you live. Um, Confucius didn't and Buddha didn't, right? And Muhammad is the same. They don't want to get people's allegiance uh, based on miracles. He, they all wanted people to change their life. They were all humble. Um, Socrates was humble, know thyself. All I know is that I don't know. When I don't know, I don't think I know, right? Confucius was the same. To have knowledge is to know what you know and don't know. Uh, Buddha was humble. They were all humble, right? Um, the, uh, the thing about Muhammad that's very um, interesting and important is that he, he considered the creation itself the greatest miracle, not interventions in the creation. He didn't think those were greater than the creation itself. Well, what's interesting about that is that it really gives a, um, 
inspires people to pursue science because when you're studying science, the creation, you're studying God and it's ordered. And when you study the order of the natural world, you're studying God's plan. And so in um, Christianity, sometimes people will say, I don't have to pay attention to climate change because God will come and fix it if he wants. So whenever that's little, that little out, that then you, you don't pursue science as much. But the Muslims were way ahead of the West um, in their pursuit of science. Um, okay, the only miracle is the Quran, and that's a book about how to live, not a book about science. Well, how did the religious establishment react? They were threatened. He threatened their polytheistic beliefs. He threatened the money they were making from all these people pilgriming, making pilgrimages into Mecca. Um, they were threatened by his criticism of their corruption. He challenged the unjust order. He challenged inequality. Yeah, okay, well, who else did? <laughs> Socrates did. Uh, you know, remember Euthyphro? Socrates says, that's why I don't take those stories literally, right? Okay, and he got accused of not believing the city's gods. Jesus, you know, said the essence is love God and love your neighbor. So he didn't focus on the legalism. Confucius um, also set up the great harmony. That was not the prevailing view among any of those little fiefdoms. And Buddha um, questioned, right? Questioned the Brahmins, all their claims about karma. Okay, and they all exposed corruption and they all were egalitarian. They challenged the, the rich and the poor, the gap especially when it was in the name of religion. And they all got in trouble for it, okay? Um, all right, so let me stop there for a second and take your reactions. Uh, Alexis, do you have a reaction? This doesn't have to be, this could be a quickie, but I just wanna check in with students. I just, the only thing that like came to my mind was that it was it's not funny but it's cool how all the religions have the same like aspects and same like they hit the same points like how gosh i can't remember exactly um like jesus buddha and all the both had like the same thing they're both they're all like crucified i guess you could say they were all like killed persecuted persecuted stuff like that that was just intriguing to me how like all of them even though they're all different religions and they all have separate ways they all hit the same they have the same things in those things in common do you think you might run into that in your life either no. personal personally no but you think you might see other people running into stuff where people don't like them because they expose corruption or they they yeah. have their own religion yeah okay uh colin Oh, Jordan. Oh, me or Jordan? Yeah, Colin. Oh, okay. Um, I kind of liked what Lexi was saying about the persecution. Like, it's, it's so, I don't know. It's just weird thinking about living in that time and, like, what they kind of went through. I don't really know, like, how to word it I guess I'm sorry okay uh, Michael oh Tim go ahead Tim so in the part where you said um, about the privileged uh, being corrupt I think that a lot of it has to do with like when you're privileged you're like it's really invisible to you because you've been born with it or like you just have it you know what I mean? Like the people who aren't privileged, they see people who are privileged and don't really like it. But the people who are privileged, they don't even notice it. They just see it as a lifestyle. So it's like if everybody knows you're privileged and and then if the, um, you said, and the whole claim to be holy and they think they're holy, 
and the leader says you are like no that's corrupt because like no that's not how it works you're, you're privileged you don't really like get that if you know what i mean by that sure do you think americans in general think you're wealthy because you worked hard and if you aren't wealthy it's because you're lazy yes a lot of a lot of do people being um not a lot of money is laziness for sure is some that, people they're inheriting but is it really the cause mm, there's, a, there's a few causes but that's one of them laziness well housing right not being able to get decent housing yeah you can't build equity and then you your kids can't go to good schools i mean it's a lot more than just laziness when you set up the system for some people to fail or to struggle a lot more yeah, that's why i was saying because if it's laziness if it's like if you know it costs a lot if i were you like don't just uh, complain try to like go out there and get as much money as you can and save up instead of complaining and living off like other people until like the rent's due and leaving and stuff like that to save up and hopefully find a cheap apartment. Yeah, but I mean, just having to live in an apartment rather than a house where you build equity. I mean, yeah. it just goes on and on. Yeah, okay, Ryan. Well, similar to what Lexi said, but the idea, not really about the idea of them getting persecuted, but like the idea that like things are super similar. Like most, I wrote my last paper kind of about the idea that both I can do the comparison between Confucius and um, Jesus. And like, I realized that like the people we look up to is like the people that like we aspire to be, but they like all have like similar backgrounds. And then that further pushed me to think of like the idea that a lot of religions have like a lot of overlap, which leads me again to my next idea that I think that all religions is like a puzzle piece to like the truth. So okay. they all, so yeah, I thought it was interesting. Okay, did you, what did you think of all my comments on your paper? Did they make sense? Yeah, I'm gonna, um, I read a few, I tried to read it, yeah. but I'm gonna go in depth with it, but um, yeah, I'm gonna look at it more in depth. Okay, so I have had time for whoever handed in something already, but I'm gonna run out of time. So I'm not gonna be able to make as many comments from now on, but I did spend time on it. Um, Michael, what about you? Um, I agree. I kind of feel like, uh, well, one, I think that like seeing these uh, these religions all all kind of start out from like the same basis. Um, I think that like like uh, like I've said before, like there is historical context of like the Bible, but I think that this also like makes it pretty apparent that like. A, a lot of these like a lot of these things did occur you know because some people view view religion as like uh, almost a completely a completely made up thing but there are definitely like historical aspects of them um and then um i don't know i don't really think that it's i i do not find it that odd that we see uh so many similarities um i actually think that that would be expected um I think, like on one hand, um, if all of these things are truly separate, uh, I do think it makes sense that we see like uh, similar um, character traits and similar um, standards and whatnot. But on the other hand, um, I don't know. They're also they're they're so similar that some could say that they're all based off of like the same human condition. <laughs> Uh, same okay, thing. so uh, do you think Greek, Greek humanism has been called, you know, it's been co-opted by Christians and all this, but it's also been considered paganism. And um, it's also the question, another question just open to keep in mind is once you have this pattern established, can you just say even self-described secular humanists actually have the same values? So that's where I kind of, you know, you can go with that. Um, Alyssa, what do you think? Um, I was kind of thinking along with what Michael was saying of how like historical these events are and the relevance of them. Because I know personally, I went through a little bit of a phase where like when I was younger, I, it, to me, going to church and everything, it just sounded like stories. Like 
bedtime stories. And then when I was in high school, like going through the confirmation process, that's when it like truly hit me. I was like, oh, this stuff happened, Alyssa. Like there's a reason this has had this impact. And like the similarities between uh, Islam and Christianity are just like astounding, yet people think they're so different. Um, that was it. Yeah, if you're Hindu or Buddhist, you think I can't tell the difference, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's way, it's not my thing. Okay, Zane, what about you? Yeah, I mean, adding on to that, kind of like off my first point, uh, have like Judaism, Islam, Christianity, how you said they're cousins and like the religion. And I mean, obviously, everybody else, they see the similarities when, when, with why, while, I can't talk right now, but people in those religions, you know, they just don't see it or they refuse to see it. But moreover, um, you see like the context of like killing the infidelities and stuff like that have been taken out of context. Well, you see that in Islam and you also see it happen in Christianity with like the Nazis and stuff like that. And then in Islam, you got the Taliban. So it seems like all of these religions that, you know, like you said, go by the book can easily be corrupted in whatever people want it to be. So, yeah. Yeah. Jesus said, I am, I am um, working for Jesus, you know, by killing the Jews. Yeah. Cause the Jews, blah, blah, the blue Jews killed Jesus or whatever. Okay. Jordan. Um, um, I similar to like what Ryan was saying, um, I think that all, and what Zane was saying, I think they're all like very similar. And it's interesting, like what he was talking about cousins. I mean, like Judaism is like a half brother of Christianity. I did not know that Hitler was saying Jesus. I well, speak for Jesus or something like Jesus that. was a Jew. I know. <laughs> it's just that the Jews killed Jesus. So, you know, I'm getting back at him. Jew on Jew crime. Like, yeah, whatever. But <laughs> I, I, I think that's ridiculous, but I, I think that, like, what Zane was saying is that they have so many similarities and, like, aspects to each other that are the same, that uh, it'd be really interesting to talk about, like, for a paper, um, for, like, my final paper, uh, where the key differences between the religions lie and the overall similar messages and how that relates to how it's seen in, like, current culture, like, how that's emulated. You might but, also, yeah. Good. I'm glad. And you might also want to bring in humanism and the way orthodox people in religions condemn humanists, right? Humanists are atheists and, you know, degenerate, whatever. So you could do that one too, if you want, Jordan. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, All right. So at least you can understand why I enjoy teaching this class. Uh, because it's not rocket science. It's just that people haven't been exposed, right? So most of, you know, there's a lot of just flat old ignorance. And you could just pick up this little Houston Smith book, you know, it costs seven bucks, it won't kill you. Um, and there it is, you can find stuff out. And we just don't. All right, so what happened? Um, he had this migration, because he started to be persecuted. And According to the Muslims, it's a turning point in world history, and they have their calendar as dated from then. And he went to Medina. He went from a prophet to a statesman, a judge, a general teacher. So he played all these roles. So he's being a role model for a complete way of life. He lived a simple life, right? Class splits are anathema to any religious leader because it's so corrupt. And um, both Plato and Aristotle said greed is the um, political evil because wanting power and wealth destroys community, um, especially when you baptize it with religion. Um, he was just as tempered with mercy. All of these, all of these guys are like that. Um, so uh, Jesus, remember, he asked people to forgive, to have mercy. Um, and Confucius didn't fight back. And Buddha, you know, they, they aren't people who fight back. Um, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And Socrates said, you know, he said, uh, you know, I'm amazed how many people voted in, in my favor. 
and the other ones for better or worse they Athens is going to get a terrible reputation for killing me so you're going to have to live with your own bad karma you know he doesn't um so then this is interesting because in Medina and I was in Indonesia so the the Muslims in Indonesia and many other places one of their major touchstones is um the Charter of Medina. It's the first time in known history that the charter for the city gave people from other religions, the Jews um, and the Christians, gave them rights and agreed to protect them. Now, they had to pay higher taxes, and they could not build synagogues or churches. But he was, you would never associate this with Muhammad religious toleration, extremely progressive religious toleration at the time. Um, there is a story at a certain point where he persecuted Jews, but that was because some of the rabbis were very extremist and they were creating social chaos. And there were other rabbis who really wanted that movement to get put down because, because they had had this peace, you know? And so, I mean, when you have these long histories, you can cite, oh, but what about the story? I know where he killed a bunch of rabbis. And then you look it up and you look at the context and you go, okay, you know, that isn't what it sounds like. So uh, that, again, there's lots of history and Houston Smith definitely gives you the most positive side, but um, it's because it's there. Um, all right, so he did conquer all these areas again. So then people say, ah, Muslim Islam is a religion of the sword, you know, as if Christianity weren't <laughs> with the Crusades. But of course, you could say, ah, but it's worse. Well, the thing Houston Smith pointed out was that there were there were people who wanted Muhammad to conquer because everything was so chaotic and or that after he conquered, their lives were more ordered, their society was more ordered, there was less infighting and civil wars. And, um, so it, it wasn't all bad and it wasn't necessarily a brutal kind of conquest. Um, but that's Houston Smith just granting that, you know? Um, all right, so the Quran is the center of faith. And um, I will read some verses from it either next time or if I have time this time. Um, but here's another important point. There's the unwritten Quran, right? The one that's in your heart, <laughs> the one that's in the universe. And then there's the written one. And that one gets corrupted by human beings' judgment. And also after it's written, it gets corrupted by human beings who are interpreting it. They might not even claim to be listening to God while they're interpreting it. So this is like Jesus says, I will write the, the, um, I will write the law on their hearts versus all the stuff written down, the Talmud and the Torah. This is where Plato actually says, nothing he's written is valuable because the real dialogue is in the soul of a person and it triggers when you have conversations with other people but the trouble with writing things down is the wrong people pick it up and misinterpret it so plato understood that jesus understood that uh, buddha understood that the corruption of all the the vedas and the doctrines and all that and confucius um he studied the old the golden age and then he he spoke Analects, but one of the students got confused because the Analects were not written down until after he died. So again, he just focused on a way of life. He didn't write things down, but once they got written down, eh, you never know what's going to happen. So, so Mohammed, it's the same thing um, and the same problem with writing it down and all the corruptions in the written 
text and in interpretations of the written text. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, the, uh, another thing is that the Quran, the, the Muslims in all the little kids in Indonesia go to Arabic school because you can only read the Quran in Arabic. And I taught at Islamic State Universities and whenever they had a big gathering, like a graduation or anything, somebody started it out by reading the Quran in Arabic. And who and it's very beautiful poetry, you know, even if you don't know what it's saying, it's very rhythmic. Um, but you could tell that the student who got asked to do that was like uh, shaking in his boots. I don't know if there was ever a girl. There might have been because they're anyway. He was shaking his boots because this was like the ultimate privilege, you know. Anyway, I mean, there's very it's the text itself is taken way more seriously because it is the direct revelation of God through Abriel. It's a much more direct uh, document than the Old, the Old Testament and the New Testament because those are explicitly written by different people at different times with different experiences. So even if you think it's inerrant, it's way more confusing than just these 20, these uh, revelations to, to Muhammad over 23 years, that's, it's a lot easier to say, well, that's inerrant, right? It's a straight chat. <laughs> um, all right, so there aren't any dramatic narratives like Arjuna, the story of Arjuna and Krishna. There aren't any historical narratives and God is not revealed in human form like Arjuna or Jesus. Um, the Old and New Testaments are directly historical and indirectly doctrinal. So you tell the story, historical story, and then God, the story with God is part of the story. <laughs> Excuse me. The Quran is directly doctrinal, right? Straight shot, what Gabriel said, God said, and it's indirectly historical. It doesn't matter that much which of those when in those 23 years uh, did, did Gabriel say this or God through Gabriel say this to him? It's not that big a deal. It's all about God, you know, it's monotheism. God speaks in first person. Um, there's no third person reports. Again, it's a very different document. Every sentence is a revelation. Um, children memorize it. And they memorize it in Arabic. So part of their life is um, in the back of their mind, driven by a different language. Their sacred language is not their daily language. Um, uh, then there's the basic concepts, monotheism, um, and it's an extension, right? Um, first, there was Jewish monotheism, it's the same God, it's just that originally it was just the Jews, and then Jesus expanded that, especially Paul, after Jesus died, opened it to the Gentiles. And then, um, but, but they don't believe that, that Christ was God incarnate. Um, Jesus was a prophet, but not God, right? And so there's a quote that you can declare war on somebody you can quote that quote from the uh, Quran and just say, okay, that's why we have to kill these people. But I don't really think that's, <laughs> that's the main point. Um, there's no parental images for God. There's no images for God, right? God is energy. God is um, infinite, omnipotent. Um, so it's important that there's only 17 citations where God is angry. And, and vengeful. And there are citations in the Old Testament where God is angry and vengeful. Uh, but there's 192 where God is merciful. So again, you see these religions killing each other off. But if you read their text, their God is way more merciful than adversarial. So it's an abuse of the texts. Um, 
the universe is material and it's also good. So that's why you study it through the sciences. Um, humankind is fundamentally good, but they forgot their divine origin. So that's, um, and so it's, you know, similar and different, but they have the same Adam and Eve story. It's the same story. Um, the proper attitude is gratitude. And infidel means someone who lacks thankfulness. It also means Islam means surrender. Um, and it's personal responsibility. And there's a day of judgment. So in Christianity and Islam in particular, there's this day of judgment. Um, and, you know, you're going to go to heaven or hell. Let's see, what time is it? Okay, I'll go a little further. So please jot down something you want to say, and I'll go a little further. You might have two things you want to say, but there's five daily prayers. And when I lived with the Muslims in Islam, they prayed five times. And the call to prayer was at like 4.30 in the morning, which ugh, drove me nuts. Uh, but they did, they were faithful. Um, sometimes when you're on a trip, Muhammad said, if you're in the middle of traveling, you can wait and collapse two of the prayers together. But the five prayers each have its own form of prayer, but it's the same five, right? The five each day are different from each other, but the five from one day to the next are the same. And they do dress up. They have a prayer shawl. I mean, I don't know, burqa. <laughs> They put over their bodies when they pray. Um, okay, and they do fast also. Um, okay, so these were some of the definite laws. There's no God but God. Muhammad is his prophet. They don't say Muhammad is the only prophet. They just say Muhammad is his prophet. Um, Submit your will to God. Okay, this great story. You know, if people are complaining about, I don't want to pray five times a day, then there's this story, right? That originally God told Moses 50 times a day. <laughs> and people said, no way. Go up there and make a deal. And it comes down 45. No, no way. Up, make a deal, 40, you know. And finally, it got to five, right? So the story is kind of, reminding people that hey it was going to be a lot worse and so that sort of gets people to accept this um all right so i don't know if you know how it works they bend down they wash uh purify themselves so the notion of purification is big in all the religions often women end up suffering for that because they're impure but um they end up with their knees with the forehead on the floor so that's like being reborn the symbolism is that you're reborn in the spirit. Um, and then they, they give charity and they fast for a month. And then they all, they also, they all want to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And so the people I work with, Tajul Arafin was the guy that had originally taught my class and I taught it and he translated. Um, he, he went to Mecca. So even people, any amount of money, you know, people can have, can save for a long, long time just to get to Mecca, which is interesting. The other thing is that they did fast and uh, Tajul had, um, okay, Tajul had kids. Uh, one of them was like 12 years old or something. And he had uh, three teenagers. And they all fasted. And I just like, oh my gosh, because I didn't, I just, I can't take it. <laughs> I get so hungry. I can't think of anything else but eating. But there they were, you know, spending the day with them and they're just fine. And they fast and they also don't drink anything. And in that weather, it's actually the thirst gets to them more than the hunger because it's humid and it's hot. Um, then I had another friend who taught at another school. He fasted every week for two days, every week. Oh my gosh. 
But, you know, if you really did that and you did it to remind yourself of your dependence on God, that would be very, I mean, it's just humbling for me to think about how reverent they really are um, and how, you know, I, I eat thoughtlessly whenever I'm hungry, I eat, you know. Um, let's see, what was Kiri doing? What did, okay. Um, he's, talking, he's talking about Kyrie, I think Kyrie Irving, a, a basketball player. Oh, did he fast? Uh, I, I'm not entirely sure, um, but I do think, uh, I'm not sure, honestly. Okay. I, I, don't. I mean, that would be amazing if he played a basketball game and didn't drink water, you know? Yeah. Um, I like doing that, because I saw a podcast with him talking about it. Okay, so he was, he hadn't drunk, eaten or drunk all day, and he'd play a game? Yeah. yeah. He is, he has legendary uh, ability, so if you're a regular person, you probably wouldn't ever do it, but he's up, one, one of the top players, so he'd be able to do stuff like that. Supposedly, yeah, I mean, like, his first, like, meal of the day was as soon as the game started, because that's when sundown hit. Oh, Always? I mean, weren't there some games earlier or the sun? Um, yeah, but they were talking like this one game. That was like oh. the first time that he ate was at night, right? Like five minutes into the game he was playing okay. and he like left the court, went ate, then came back. Okay. I mean, the thing that's interesting during Ramadan is at five in the morning, 430, they do have a big meal. And then after the sun goes down, they do have a big meal. So <laughs> they do try to make up for it um i don't think he had transitioned to islam for quite like i think this has been a recent i i, yeah, I could be wrong but i don't think that all his life he uh has followed okay him. so i do want you to react to this second section of the outline right um his let's see where did we leave off um seal of the prophets, all of this, the Bible, the difference between the Bible and the Quran, if you want to comment on that, or um, the theology or, um, and the five pillars, the whole habits and customs thing, rituals. So I, I want you to comment something on that. Colin, what you got? Oh, I was going to, oh, I was just going to talk about like the adventure to Mecca. Okay. Like, personally, that sounds insane that everyone, like, has to make it at least one time, and most of these people don't live near it, so their commutes are insane. Yeah, so it's in Saudi Arabia, and the Saudis make a lot of money off of this, <laughs> right? Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's a big deal. Um, Tim, do you have something? Wait, can I just say something? Sure. Uh, I thought, uh, honestly, I feel like that's one of their, kind of one of their more dated, like, pillars. I feel like that, uh, I, I don't know, I feel like their expectation of this religion wasn't, wasn't maybe something where they would have people necessarily that far away um, to go, if you, you know. Well, it's a sense of solidarity with global Islam. You know, you meet people from all over the world. And so it is a very, you know, way to charge up your your faith, right? Uh, so I think, I, for better or worse, I think it it works. Um, Tim. Well, for for first, what I want to comment on is, you said you were down there, kind of like you were doing a lot of complaining when it comes to having to. Um, Pray that many times, I'm like a lot of complaining over there. Actually, not me, but the story, right? Oh, There's, okay. Because no, that, it wasn't me. It's a story that they tell about. Oh, fifty times is a lot. Oh my God. Well, that's the story is that God told Moses to tell people that's what you got to do. And then and the then, story is that he kept negotiating down until he got to five. Yeah, and then um. I want to talk about the Quran and how it can be corrupted. 
I've always thought this throughout my life. Whenever I go to church and all that stuff, I'm because like when they say like, oh yeah, but it's in the Bible, in the Bible. But my my heart, I've always said, how do you know somebody didn't just didn't write it and just make all that up? But how do you know that's actually true? Like you can't just think that's true because somebody can easily print some out and change the whole book up by putting one word in it. So what do you think they can do with the whole book? That's why I never. I'm not saying I don't believe in it, but if it don't like hit to me personally, I probably won't believe it. Because like certain things, like certain um places you go, they'll like um preach and all that, and they might say stuff that's not right. But if everybody's already believing you, who gonna like who's gonna say, step up and say, wait, I don't believe this. This is not true. A lot of people aren't gonna do that. That's why and they said Quran is um, corrupted, and then they said um about because somebody can interpret it the wrong way and tell everybody else that and not everybody interpret it the wrong way. It's really about the soul of the person that's really what happening, not really was writing. So you don't exactly know that what happened back then, he wrote exactly what happened. You just gotta guess because obviously we don't know. They aren't right. eyewitnesses. Like a lot of the writers yeah, we're not eyewitnesses. are eyewitnesses to what they're writing about. And then there's things like a Levitic a priest will write a bunch of rules. Well, really? Did he get those like hotline to God or is this what he thought? I mean, one of the things in one of the one of the books is that you could treat your slaves however you want to. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, who said that? Uh, the priest or God, you know? Yeah, I think so, Tim. I See, I think that the people who put it together didn't expect blind fundamentalist literalism they said here's a whole bunch of stories about people's relation to god and you have to figure out what your relationship is i i think all those books are like that all the ancient texts are like that they're not intended to be taken literally it's modern science that emphasizes literalism so. and also like some people like i don't know if this relates to about like, the founding fathers and stuff they try to like tie that into it it's like the founding fathers everybody keeps talking about are also slave owners. Like, <laughs> they were slave owners. Yeah, they so also they're like, not literalists. They're slave owners. They're not, they, the slaves don't get an option to be slave. They have to, or they can die. Like they get forced to get over there. If they die on the way there, it doesn't matter. You're still a slave. Like, they what? were slave like, owners. They were religious heretics. Yeah, so they were political says, revolutionaries. That, that, like, no, they're, they're slave owners. Just don't, let's not forget that. They weren't just, oh, oh yeah, let's, uh, let's appease to the slaves. Like, no, they did not do that. <laughs> they were bad yeah. people. Okay, just, that's right. Alyssa, what do you want to say? Um, when we were talking about the Quran and the Bible, it just kind of like came to me how I feel like, I can't think of a better way to say it, but I feel like the Quran and, um, I mean, the Quran really sets up its followers better for success because there is so much open-endedness like within the bible or in the torah and stuff um but the quran's pretty straightforward and i think that's one of the like benefits about islam but also at the same time it can be a detriment because as straightforward as it is some people may take it you know like too literally and not it can be it can get pretty intolerant then right yeah yeah, there's pros and cons, honestly. Yeah. Uh, Zane? Not there. Jordan? I'm sorry, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't really have much of uh, comments or anything like that, but just kind of like uh, something I found funny and kind of bizarre was, kinda, was also like the story you talked about of how god told moses at first it was 50 times a day you know people's like what like nobody's gonna do this um and just kind of like how he kept negotiating i just found that story pretty bizarre so i mean that's just all i was going to comment on <laughs> it would make you accept it you know when you really don't want to <laughs> okay jordan what have you got i just a lot of the stories in the bible feel a lot like fairy tales almost like they just don't make sense to me um 
And there's like no other history of shit like that actually happening besides the Bible. So like, you know, like whenever the Jews were out in the desert and they were like, like, I think it was like they're idolizing a false god or something like that. Yeah, Canaan. And then there was like the Tower of Babel because yeah. th- that's insane. That is actually insane. Like, we have concrete evidence there was a Pangea. And then because the separations of the different um, continents, it, it became different places. That's why we have different pigmentations. That's why we have different languages. But it all originated from one language. Like, I don't know. It just seems a little far-fetched to me. Well, not only that, I have a student who was taught that when they were climbing the Tower of Babel, uh, some people fell off and fell into the mud. And those are African-Americans, dark-skinned people. And that's why they're inferior or something, some dang thing like that. And, (laughs) oh, God. So, I, yeah, heads up, guys. (laughs) Uh, these texts can be used for nefarious purposes. Um, All right, so there's that. And then this part is um, the social teachings. Yeah, Uh, once again, let's get back to the social teachings, right? They all are against class. They all advocate generosity. Uh, They're not the... Religions of the book are not against the profit motive, but they're against uh, greed. Um, He's against boys inheriting everything. So the fact that girls inherited wealth was absolutely bizarre. Muhammad was really progressive in his day. Girls are not property. You can't sell them off. They inherit. That's incredible because that means some women can actually have their own economic self-sufficiency, which was just absolutely bizarre. So, I mean, now we might emphasize that she, the girls only get half. Half is a big chunk compared to nothing. Um, he was against tribalism, against abuses of women. He if you're going to have more than one wife, you have to have her separate household. She has to be taken care of. If you can't afford it, you don't get more than one. Um, there was a reason why he allowed for more than one, and that was because so many men were killed. They died earlier. The women just didn't have any way to provide for themselves. So, um, And then the fact that Mohammed required they be cared for uh, increased, improved their status. Um, and then they, you know, they could, they were educated. Some of them got educated. I mean, they weren't deprived of well being um, as wives. So, all right, he was against uh, self indulgence and all that. Um, the Quran leaves open the possibility of equality. And I have a friend who really emphasized that. She was a Muslim. Uh, f- uh, feminist um, marriage is sanctified um, women have to give consent divorce is only a last resort um, that's been corrupted but I'll just leave it there for, for now um, all right they have to provide for their wives why there was polygamy um, the veiling of women was not the way it is now it wasn't that extreme Um, He allowed for interracial marriage. That's incredible. I mean, that is hugely progressive. Um, The jihad martyrs. All right. He he, Mohammed was not into fanaticism. Um, But if you think about it, Hinduism had uh, just war. And the Christian tradition has always had some wars are just. and uh, Arjuna was supposed to, you know, Krishna told him he needed to go kill his cousins to bring back positive karma. So the fact that Islam has these religious wars doesn't dis- distinguish it from Christianity or Judaism or um, Hinduism. It just, um, but it gets associated with some pretty radical stuff. 
um, like the Crusades, you know. Um, there's rules for war, and there are nowadays there is a just war theory that's really long, has all these criteria, and Islam has has a just war theory that's either identical or very similar to the one that the Christians have. Um, he systematized the laws of, of morality. He was tolerant. The Charter of Medina was the first charter that allowed freedom of conscience, of religious conscience. Um, and so, yeah, both of them can go to extremes. Um, there's different types of Islam. The, there are more mystics. Um, just like there's a contemplative tradition in a monastic tradition in Christianity. And there is a, actually a, a mystic tradition in Judaism too. I can't remember what it's called. It starts with an H. Um, anyway, then there was this problem with after Muhammad died, who's going to take over as the caliph or the leader? And there was this huge power struggle. And that's the problem between the Sunni and the Shia. And that is a huge problem. And in the Mideast, the Iranians are the Shia and the Saudis are the Sunni. And they know who they are and they care, okay? And um, Iraq has a combination, but we, you know, most Americans just don't get it and we keep interfering in a whole lot of stupid ways because we have our own agenda which is money but um the animosity between those two is huge and uh it's going to affect um, politics for a long time um right now of course the u.s sides with the sunni which is saudi arabia against iran and then there's the Sufi is the mystics. And um, so she asked way long ago, this is, a, this is an old book, uh, where is Islam going, right? Is it gonna modernize? Um, is it gonna globalize? Um, is it going to become pluralistic? Um, all right, so, and that's open question in uh, Indonesia. The vast majority of Muslims right now, although it's changing, it's becoming more extremist. But when I was there the first time, especially, the vast majority are um, plural, pluralistic and they want this integration of democracy and Islam. And the scholars in Islamic universities are publishing more books that relates Islam to moderation and democracy than um, any other country at the time, because they just have a lot of people. So that would be sociologists, historians, Quran scholars, um, all sorts of, all different fields. They keep arguing for uh, Muhammad favored democracy, um, if you, when you combine church and state, it's a corruption of the, the church because people will convert just to get a better job, just out of ambition. They'll say, oh yes, I'm Muslim. And it corrupts uh, politics because the politicians can be corrupted. They could say, oh no, I'm Muslim. I'm doing what God wants. Um, so, so uh, you know, the majority of Muslims in the world, because they're out in Southeast Asia, would combine um, modernism, um, democracy with Islam. But who knows, it's a very fluid situation. When I go over there, I'm going to go over there in a couple months. Um, I've read that it's there are extremists who are having more and more influence in the lives of the, the masses. So we'll see what happens. Um, and then there was this big issue, Colin Powell. Um, everybody was, when Obama was running, I don't know if you know, oh, he's Muslim, blah, blah, you know, and blah, blah, blah. It, it wasn't true, but you know, you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of leverage off of that. And um, Colin Powell, who was George W. Bush's Department of Defense, head of Department of Defense, 
said, well, what if he were? Like, what's the big deal? <laughs> I mean, we have a Muslim Americans, what's the problem? And then at the Democratic National Convention, there was a couple, a Muslim couple whose son was killed in the Iraq war. And he was a, he won the five stars, he won the golden star or whatever, their son, he was a hero. And, you know, like what's wrong with that? Muslims are Americans. American Muslims are committed to America. And then there was Keith Ellison at the US House. He was sworn into office on a Quran that he checked out from Thomas Jefferson's library. So uh, one final reaction about the social teachings or something that I just said that you would want to react to. Okay, Colin. I am so sorry. Can you repeat that one more time? Just one more reaction. One last reaction to what I just covered. Can you come back to me? Sure. Uh, Michael? Um, yeah, so I, this kind of wraps into the last thing we were talking about too. Um, but one of like the pillars, which I think is kind of more of a, a social like a uh, thing for them is the fact that they uh, like pay in. Or whatever, like oh, the, the yeah, two point five percent of their assets, yeah, right, 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 and that goes to like poor people, like that. I think that that is like uh, kind of not crazy in like a bad way, but crazy in an unheard of way that um, that is like built into their religion to support their lower income people. Well, supposedly we're supposed to tithe. You know, the Bible has ten percent. But um, yeah, but a lot of times, especially like here in the South, like the tithe goes to keeping the church afloat. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I the mean, preacher it, it, and all that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it keeps the light bill on and it pays everybody like that's, you know, and I, I, I don't know the exact specifications on how they use their 2.5%. But from what we read, it's not to do that. The other thing is um, it's 2.5% of all your assets where it's 10% of your income, I think. And so that's important. Another thing is that they have these banks that don't, uh, don't have usury because the Bible says no usury. You, shouldn't be, you can't loan money for, for interest. That's against the Bible. Yeah, I mean, Christians don't even know that if they want to be literalists, you shouldn't have, have credit cards, you shouldn't get a loan from a bank for your house, your mortgage or your car, because all that is evil. Um, that's why the Jews did it. And that's why they got in trouble. Um, but anyway, the banks in Indonesia, and I think all the Muslim countries, technically don't charge interest. I don't know how they get around it, but they do have this special kind of bank. And so when the banking system collapsed, these banks didn't collapse because why did it collapse? Because of all the loans. So, you know, they'd say, yeah, the Bible is right. And we're following it and we're, we're, you know, doing better because of that. So just, you know, just a heads up how we appear to other people that our sins, we're paying for our sins, right? Living in debt all the time. Um, Tim, what is your reaction to what the last section there? Well, I don't, I don't know. Something about getting a percentage of something that's mine that does not sit well with me. It's getting a percentage of anything like, uh, I did, uh, words for it now. Not really. Mm. Okay, but they have a rule about being generous, right? Yeah. So they had to, yeah. Um, anything else that struck you? I mean, not really. This that that was like, oh man. I mean, I'll be generous, but yeah. Oof, what okay. if what if I needed that one day? Well, yeah. I need something. Um, yeah. In general, I will say that poorer people tend to give a higher percentage of their income away, which is very humbling. You know, I mean, it's a way smaller amount of money. I mean, like Bill Gates, well, not Gates. Um, oh, who, the head of Amazon. You're talking uh, about- uh, Bezos. Yeah, he would have to give billions to give two and a half yeah. percent, you know? Yeah. Uh, 
and they don't, right? They do not do that. Mm. Um, Alyssa, what do you think? Oh, Dr. Beck, question. Yeah. What is like the tax situation there? Because um, obviously taxes are kind of like a-, a Yeah, that's thing. right. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that, especially if it's for public education, public health care, you know. Um, I'm not sure, but I did tell them how much per person we pay for military, 2,200 bucks. They absolutely couldn't believe it. You know, it's like 50 bucks or something for them. You know, it. we are way, way, way out of kilter with the rest of the world. Um, we spend as much as the next six countries combined. <laughs> yeah, okay, Alyssa? Um, it all just really made me think about how progressive uh, Islam is, especially since we, like most of us view it as such a backwards oppressive religion and just how like wrong the, uh, the majority has it on there. And like, I'm not saying it's a perfect religion, but it's far more progressive than we like to think. And Socrates was progressive, and Jesus was progressive, and Confucius was progressive, and Buddha was progressive, and our founding fathers were progressive. So how does religion get tied to conservative? <laughs> eh. <laughs> uh, Zane. Good point, Alyssa. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, just the point about like what you said of how even in India, it's going to be like it's heading towards more of like an extremist. Uh, more of an extremist view and stuff like that and uh i mean that's because ideologies are so extreme and you know radical of each other that you know it's hard for people to have conversations and that's i mean that's not helping anybody really um but i mean I, it's not to say that you can't be faithful to your religion i mean i'm a christian and i'm gonna be you know i'm gonna be faithful to my religion but that doesn't mean i'm going to be like hey if you don't follow my religion you know i don't want to talk to you i don't want anything to do with you or you know i wish bad upon you or anything like that so but uh yeah it's just unfortunate so you happen to be going to college at a time when when religion is being weaponized in a lot of countries india sri lanka has fallen apart um indonesia is getting worse Anyway, it's it's bad, but as long as you know that's a complete corruption, there's no reason for it. Um, Jordan? Um, I had a point, but I kind of forgot it. Uh, but, I, oh, I, I did have a thought that like, one of the main proponents of violence against Jewish people are Christians. I think it's a proponent with the Bible and how it betrays Jewish people and focuses on certain stories that emphasize Jewish people in a certain light, um, which I find very interesting. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we should be, we're all the chosen people as opposed to some other people, right? <laughs> well, I think when they emphasize that people are Jewish is whenever they do not follow jesus because those people were jewish they didn't call themselves christians until later right. like they were still jewish people but they don't talk about them being jewish because they're followers of god but those are still jewish people so it's like they emphasize it whenever it's someone who's in opposition but never in the same thing so what was it called that um i don't know the jesus group or something i can't remember um Let's see, I was gonna say, dang, I was gonna say one other thing. Um, I don't know, I lost it. What were you talking about, Jordan? Oh, let's see. Oh yeah, one other thing. I heard an interview by a guy who's a conspiracy theorist, but they interviewed him. Well, he's against capitalism. Yes, capitalism is ruining things and it's exploiting people and it's a conspiracy to take people down. I was like, okay. Well, it turns out it's turned into anti-Semitism. Like, yeah, but it's the Jews that are the capitalists. Like, wait a sec. That's not true. And so he was head of that. He's the replacement movement in Charlottesville and all this stuff. 
and why on earth do you follow Donald Trump? He's a capitalist, you know? I mean, he put five of the, his cabinet members out of 12 are billionaires who exploited people to get billionaires. So I do not understand why somebody who's anti-capitalist would also be pro-Trump. Just on a, you know, an absolutely technical point, he's a capitalist. He's not a good employer. Um, and then he, he put all his billionaire buddies in charge. That's not capitalism. Anyway, I'll let you go. Uh, it triggers, it's triggered anti-Semitism, Jordan, uh, among other things, you know. So racism, replacement theory, whatever. You guys have a lot to look forward to. You got to run the zoo one of these years. Good luck. See you tomorrow. Oh, hey, Dr. Beck. Yeah. Uh, I got a few, I got a few papers that I'm gonna be turning in soon just for you to kind of look at to just make sure like I don't need to change anything or stuff like that, but I'll be sending those into you really shortly. Well, they're late enough at this point where I'm not gonna do, you know, this is it. Okay. You're gonna hand it in for your grade. If you'd hand it in on time or something, that would be fun. okay. All right. So that's okay. good. Thanks. Yep, yep. Oops. Hey Dr. Beck. Yeah. Um, 